He's been working there since the fall of 2017. Now that everyone's been able to move around, get some coffee, grab a snack, I'm expecting outstanding participation later on in this presentation. Because if you read the bio, you saw that this is going to, or at least I'm going to try to make this a little interactive. So uh, psych yourselves up for that. Um, so when Jeff Todd and I were deciding on what angle to take this extraordinary event, the Memorial Day Tornadoes of 2019, without having a bunch of overlap and showing you all the same things, um, the best idea that we came up with was to try and think about this through the lens of constructive and destructive storm interference. With if we like would have paused Brian's presentation at the first five minutes and then I could have came up and then he could have finished, it would have worked really, really well. Um, so, so Brian's presentation was a fair segue um, into this one here. Um, we'll get, we'll of course get into some damage photos here later on, but I will talk briefly about the, 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 the ones that you see um, on the screen there. Um, on the far left, uh, we have damage from an EF2 tornado that destroyed a machine shed, and that was in the southwest portion of, of La Fontaine, Indiana. And then uh, the next photo after that is a two-story home uh, that was leveled near Macy, Indiana, and that's one of the tornadoes that we're going to um, talk about a lot here uh, during this presentation. And then very lastly on the far right, some interesting damage indicators on that one. Uh, that was a custom trailer manufacturing uh, plant, um, and that was EF3 damage near Montpelier. So without further ado, um, we'll get into this presentation here. Uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about is mesoscale conditions. Uh, I like to follow the top-down approach, so we'll kind of refresh some of the ingredients that we were uh, looking at for this day. Uh, the two tornadoes that we're mainly going to talk about are the Macy tornado and then uh, the other tornado that was the strongest one uh, occurred north of Roll, Indiana. And then we're going to get into the discussion, so looking for some audience participation uh, using some GRT <coughs> analy uh, analysts. And we're going to kind of just talk about, uh, as best we can, describing and locating some of this constructive or destructive interference. I'll get a little bit into some scientific research papers and then uh, we'll conclude with some satellite data thereafter. So this, uh, all these times here are going to be uh, 19Z, so it was several hours before things got started, um, but we're going to first, uh, starting at the top here, 300 millibars, uh, you'll notice that there's a pretty, pretty strong jet stream uh, moving in over the north and west uh, of our greater area here. There, there are some pockets of upper level divergence, uh, that's going to be the, the magenta contours going on there off to our north and west. If we look down just a little bit farther to 500 millibars, uh, now we're starting to see uh, kind of a broader uh, jet stream moving closer into our area of interest. And you're also starting to get a little bit of a shortwave trough moving into northern Iowa, and it's kind of rippling its way uh, in towards western Illinois as well. You can see uh, hints of a broader scale ridge off to the south and west. Lower is where I think things start to get interesting, 700 and, and then down to the surface. Here, now we can start to see a closed low over northern Iowa, southern uh, Minnesota there, and then a nice, nice pull of dew points off to our, our north and west. But notice um, from our wind field when we started at 500 millibars, our winds were from the west. Now we're starting to become from the southwest, and this continues as, as, as we go farther down. The winds continue to back as we go down through um, the lower levels. Now this is 850 here. Um, you can almost infer where a, a warm front would start to lie based on these, on these dew points. Um, we had a moisture-rich atmosphere being advected into our uh, area. Um, at this time, it was just off to the south and west of the northern Indiana County warning area. And yet again, you can still see the, this closed low located over Iowa uh, moving uh, towards our area. Winds at this time, uh, generally about 40 knots over, over Illinois, a little bit weaker here as you get into Indiana, but of course, um, if we were to step forward in time, that's when our, our low-level winds would start to ramp up. Now our wind direction is almost from the south-southwest at this point in time. Who here still does hand analysis? Um, oh, so few, so few. Does anyone uh, at, at Ohio State, do the students still learn hand analysis? 
Yeah, yeah, still seeing nine hands. Okay, okay, that's very good. Um, so this is actually a service analysis that I did uh, the afternoon of the event. I reported for an evening shift, and that's just one of the ways that I like to get spun up before a severe weather event because I've quickly learned beware of fronts. Even if it's just a no-risk situation or just a general thunderstorm situation, beware of the fronts because things can, can go awry there. Um, you can tell that I did this um, on the day of the event and not for this presentation because I did goof up on this 1008 millibar line. I got creative, so when you're doing hand analysis at your desk, you can get a little creative. Um, but I do want to highlight th this uh, moisture pooling down here. So these dew points are in the 70s, temperatures were in the 80s. That might sound nice to some individuals in the room. Um, but look at this backed flow, flow here, off to the south and east, uh, just south of this warm front that's, that's lifting into the area. Um, obviously, th this would generally be our area of focus uh, for the remainder of this event. Looking at uh, some of the two-hour pressure falls, you can kind of get a sense for where this surface low would be moving. Uh, once again, our, our winds now at the surface are generally from the southeast, and you have a nice deep surface low over extreme northern Iowa. One more thermodynamic thing uh, to take a look at, uh, mixed layer cape and mixed layer sin. At this point in time, most of the, the, the higher values were, were off to the south. Again, this warm front uh, was still kind of working its way into the area, but this is the 2,000 uh, joule contour, and then this is uh, about 500 uh, joules per kilogram of CAPE. And the reason why I chose mixed layer CAPE and mixed layer SIN is some of the scientific papers that I was looking at when you're discussing mergers, um, they examined mixed layer CAPE in uh, both merging with a tornado and merging without a tornado, and there really wasn't much of a difference. Um, so you can't necessarily look at one ingredient and say, yep, when those storms merge under this mixed layer CAPE value, we're going to get a tornadic merger. Um, that, that's just not, not quite the case. So that's why I chose the mixed layer. So now this is about 23Z uh, when some of the earliest tornadoes were first starting to be reported. Of course, now we have all the instability uh, moving into our area, and then our surface winds were from the southeast. If you recall from 850, we're off, off to the south and west. So you can kind of imagine what that vertical wind shear profile might look like. You can imagine what that hodograph might look like as well for this event. I said this was going to be interactive, right? Okay. So this is a, a base reflectivity snapshot. I want you to shout at me your choices for which storms might go on to produce tornadoes. Now, if you're not ready to commit yet, I do have velocity on the next image. So maybe let's just kind of pause right here and think about which storm or storms would go on to produce tornado or tornadoes. All right, here's your velocity. Okay, so I've heard some mutterings for A. What other, okay, I'm hearing a B is in boy. E, E is an easy, okay, easy tornado. Yeah, that's how I did this, right? No. <laughs> okay, so sorry, I've heard A, B, and E. C, okay, okay. All. Okay, all the above, all right. So, uh, so, so welcome to the world of uh, working radar sometimes, so, like which one of these are going to be tornadic, and uh, the answer can sometimes be any of them. Well, the specific answer that we're going for here is actually A and C. So if I step back one to kind of familiarize yourself with the scene, A and C, then I'm gonna play this radar loop so you can kind of see how they interact. Okay, so there's one tornado. And then watch later on when things get going even more. You can probably see it better on the velocity data. So you had A and then C. And watch that area from A. A gets messy really fast, but you can see the interaction between A and C that really got the storm going. Um, that was the storm near Roll, Indiana, um, which is shown right here on the map. So I'll play that one more time just because I did hear one whoa, so we'll let the whoa factor <laughs> sound. <laughs> And we'll get into GR2 Analyst because it can be a little bit easier to dissect and step through instead of just looking through these MP4s. But um, just for... Just, just for the benefit here, we'll, we'll play this one more time uh, before moving on. Um, so so that, that storm that went on to produce the, the rural tornado, that's probably the best um, opportunity here for, for constructive uh, storm <coughs> interference, and we'll talk about that here later. 
so the five tornado tracks that we had in our county warning area are, are here on this Google uh, map. This orange is, is the EF3, this one's near Macy. That went on to produce an EF1 north of North Manchester, which there's a, there's a small university here. And um, also we had a little EF1 outside of Grissom Air Force Base. Um, EF2, a little bit farther south and east, and then uh, this was the big one, uh, the farther off to the, the south and east, that one was near Roll, Indiana. So one of the two main tornadoes that I, that I want to highlight here is one, uh, began just north of Macy, Indiana. It was shortly before 0Z. Zero Z. It was an EF3 tornado with estimated peak winds of 140 miles per hour, a solid path length of 14 miles, but look at that width. 800 yards, um, you know, do the classic thinking of your football field. I mean, that is a massive tornado uh, that, that, that tracks through that area. <coughs> Thankfully, um, injuries and deaths were none on this storm. So that is, of course, very good news. Some of the damage photos. Um, on the top left, uh, these are all from our, from our storm survey here. Um, there were only a few interior walls remaining of the single-story home in the top left. And some of the additional photos from that storm survey showed a lack of anchors for those outside walls. So um, I'm seeing some heads nodding, you know, what the, the general public may just see this damage and, and assume the worst, but it can be the subtle things such as anchorings. Those are what uh, the, the meteorologists and then of course the engineers uh, that can participate on the storm surveys, those are some things that we think about when we're coming up with our damage indicators and how strong those winds might be. Now on the top right, that was an EF3 damage point. A two-story home was destroyed. Once again, it was noted that no anchor bolts were connecting the walls to the cinder blocks. So now you have a very weak wall that was able to be removed uh, pretty handily from uh, the foundation there. Perhaps the most interesting photo is the one on the lower left. Um, that is your ginormous transmission tower that you typically see. Um, I was not on the storm survey, but I just think that would be incredible to see one of those crumpled laying on the ground like that. Um, just impressive, incredible to imagine here. Now there was already, already some radar discussion in some of the morning presentations, so uh, th this was something that we set aside as well. And uh, what we're looking at here uh, is our correlation coefficient. Again, the, the blues are going to be our biological scatters, our debris in this case. And we had a, a debris ball up to about 13,000 feet at this timestamp of about 2353Z uh, shortly after the tornado started. And then that got up to about 16,000 feet uh, during the, the middle or almost the peak of the storm. And you can see that here in this lower uh, right panel, or I guess middle right panel would be more accurate. And then here's your velocity data. And then here's your differential uh, reflectivity that you're looking at here. Of course, uh, very clear indicators that, that we're looking at a tornado based on your debris ball, your hook echo, your, your, and your velocity data. Um, so this would certainly be a good example of a radar confirmed tornado in that example. Moving on to the Roll, Indiana tornado. This one was also an EF3. Uh, winds were a little bit lower in this instance. Uh, peak winds of 125 uh, happened just before 9 p.m. Eastern time. Path length was still pretty good, 12.8 miles. This was a much narrower tornado, only about 150 yards wide. There were two injuries from this event, and that was a result of a propane tank that might be like sitting outside a farm home uh, to, to provide uh, their, their heating or whatever it may be. Um, that was rolled over onto a couple individuals. So that, those were the injuries that resulted from that storm. I would also like to highlight uh, the town of Montpelier off to the south here. Um, that's a town of about 1,700 people. So if this was shifted just a little bit farther south, uh, th this could have been a different scenario. So on this date, um, at least in our county warning area, a big factor for why there was not a significant loss of life and loss uh, and injuries in that, it mainly hit rural areas, um, the, the tornadoes. You could even see it on the earlier map. Um, this, this missed um, some of our populated areas. Turning now to some damage photos, uh, this top left is going to be EF3 damage point. Um, that was a newly constructed, well-built metal building, um, and truck trailers were made at this place. Uh, heavy anchors and heavy metal beams were noted, and then also in this greater area, multiple vortices were noted during the survey as well. Perhaps the most interesting damage indicator um, from our survey team was this thick metal beam here that gets twisted 
right about here. Um, so this was a photo that we made sure to send off uh, to, to um, some of the folks up at Central Region and then even into some uh, wind engineers um, because that, that looks like a pretty hardy beam that was impacted um, by this tornado and resulted in, in, in part uh, the failure of that building. Once again, I don't have an engineering degree, so that's my, that's my caveat. In the lower left, um, this was a huge dairy farm um, that unfortunately left 20 cows killed and 150 cows were injured. So this was a huge operation um, that, that was impacted by this uh, storm and that uh, was also indicative of the EF3 the damage on that day. Once again, turning to some of the radar data, these debris balls were uh, a little bit lower, about, about six and 7,000 feet. I'll highlight it for you here. Um, once again, we're looking for the blues are gonna be more your biological scatters. Um, so they reach uh, just, just under 10,000 feet is where we're looking at here. I mean, you still see a nice velocity couplet. The signature on base reflectivity is, is a little muddied, but you can still see um, on your correlation coefficient um, that you do have so some lower values. Um, there your, your, your blues and greens um, with, with uh, indicative of some of the damage there. So this is the part in time where I'm gonna look for a little bit of your participation and a little bit of your discussions and, and thoughts as we, as we kind of take the next few minutes to, to kind of step through some of these storms and think about what might be going on. Which storm is interacting with which one? Is it a positive in, uh, interaction? Is it a negative interaction? Um, th these are some things that, are, that I'm going to, 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 to try to uh, bring up to you all here. So the, the first thing I want to ask is if I zoom into this area, um, how many supercells might you be able to pick out? Um, and these are not your um, Oklahoma supercells. These are your Piddly, Indiana, and Northwest Ohio uh, supercells. So um, correct your mind as needed. Seven. Say that again? Seven. Seven, okay. Three. Five, or six. Five, okay. Any others? Six. Six. Six, okay. So anywhere from, I believe the low end was three or four, and the high end was about seven. Okay, I generally tend to agree with all of those. Um, <laughs> when I was practicing this, I did not necessarily think that that would uh, respond in laughter, but okay, I'll take it. Um, so, so my five, my five that I would pick um, would be this Argos storm. This would be storm number one that I would think about. The other one I would think about is this greater Rochester area storm. Um, this other one towards Walton is very interesting. And then Peru, and then perhaps my favorite would be this one um, down in Converse. Um, those, those would be my, my five that I would pick on. Um, if, if there are other ones that, that you would suggest, um, let's hear a couple of them. Is there any other one you, you, you might want to highlight? It's okay, this is a symposium, we're learning. Can I ask why the one by Converse is your favorite? So this one by Converse is my favorite because, um, so in part this isn't a composite radar, but I like this one because it is alone. Um, typically, you know, you're thinking, all right, uninhabited environment, this thing is just gonna go nuts. Um, and we'll see in the future how that one plays out. But that, that's one that kind of my gut initially is like, ooh, let, let's, let's watch that one because it cause it's, has a very clean environment to perhaps work with. Um, so, but moving forward, um, you know, we, we, we kind of know which, which storms are, are the ones that produce tornadoes. But um, let, let, let's say, for example, that you didn't. Um, and, and we'll zoom in here to the one that went on to produce um, the, 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 the Macy or uh, tornado. And this one's going to be right here. And I want you to kind of think about if this one was perhaps the result of some constructive interference. As I step through here, you can kind of see it looks like it, in, it ingests something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's tough to say if this is really, I, I, I mean, a storm, but there's clearly something that, that shoots in from the north and east. Does everyone kind of see that? Seeing mm -hmm. seen some heads nodding, right? Um, so, so it's interesting to see that as that gets ingested, then all of a sudden this wraps up pretty quick um, into what goes on to, to, to be the Macy tornado. And you can even see this on your velocity data as well. That very late in the period, there's a, there's a surge of, of these inbound velocities, and then this, this storm gets wrapped up and it ends up to be the Macy storm. Now, this goes on for some time. 
But then, of course, it comes to an end until it gets north of North Manchester, and then it becomes the, the, the smaller storm thereafter. So when I was looking at the data, I kind of struggled to, to find a, a specific factor. You know, okay, this is why the, the, the storm ended, and then it continued on just north of North Manchester. Does anyone kind of see any interactions that might be going on, or is this just a simple cyclic uh, kind of life cycle that we'll see in our supercells? Does anyone want to chime in on that? Anyone? It looks like there's ingestion of some moisture. There's something yeah, there. right there. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely looks like you know there there, there is some kind of ingestion going on. Um, that some people think that a, that a moisture boundary might be at play. Um, so something even very very small at the mesoscale uh, level <coughs> that might be going on. All of these are possibilities. Again, this is why I wanted this to be an engaging part of the presentation because. It, it, as we'll see in some of the scientific research, this interaction stuff is, is, is challenging to, to really pick apart. The other thing that I want to note is this storm up here. Um, I do believe that we had a wall cloud reports, and we even had a report of a tornado on the ground, but no damage was found. So then I started thinking, okay, what's the distance between this storm that produced a tornado and this one that did not? Well, the answer was about 12 miles. Okay, so is 12 miles kind of like a magical, too close of a number uh, for, for these storms to interact? This one can't get enough good inflow because of this storm off to the south. Those are some of the things that I started thinking about. Well, meanwhile down here, um, th this La Fontaine uh, storm that, that, that went on um, to, to produce the Montpelier storm, um, this one was doing all right. Th this one, okay, it's farther south, maybe it's closer to the moisture environment, but the distance from this storm to this storm is now about 22 miles. So does that extra 10 miles make a difference? I don't know. It's, it's something interesting to, to consider in that case. <coughs> Now I do need to move on uh, to the roll tornado, um, so let me get that um, up on our map here. And so as we step through in this event, let me re-catch my bearings for a second. Okay, so here's Montpelier, so we're going to play through these storms here. So the main thing I want you to watch is how the storms coming uh, from south of Marion these are the storms and its associated outflow that we think uh, resulted in the constructive interference that went on to produce the, the potent storm near Roll, Indiana. So watch how, as these inbounds come screaming in, they wrap up so quick into that Roll tornado. There's a little bit of a skip there, and I apologize. So this is perhaps the best example of the constructive interference that we're, that we're seeing in this storm. Um, and then it went on for its, for its 12 uh, mile track or so, and then uh, but before storms continued to move out of our area. Now, uh, there was this interesting signature here um, in, near, near Bluffton as well, uh, perhaps a little bit of a cell merger uh, going on with that. Once again, this was, we had a report of a wall cloud or a funnel cloud in that area, but there was uh, no damage found um, indicative of a, of a tornado moving through there. Um, so, so that could be another example of perhaps constructive or maybe some destructive because the tornado did not occur during that time. So by this point in this event, uh, this was our last tornado that we worked with. Of course, we can see uh, Salina, Ohio, um, as the storms then exited our county warning area and then uh, went on into the Wilmington, Ohio county warning area. So through that radar loop, I hope that I, that I demonstrated uh, in part that, you know, this constructive destructive interference, it's happening all over the place and it's really tough to, to pick it out maybe on the fly and to get a strong answer for, for which ones may produce the tornado <coughs> and may not produce the tornado. But if we move on to uh, some examples of some research in this area, um, Jarrett Rogers over at the Storm Prediction Center, he took a look at a five-year period of EF2 or greater storms. And uh, the reason why EF2 or greater was picked out because uh, they wanted to kind of clean up your marginal environments, your zeros, your ones, um, when the environment can be just that, a little marginal. So um, there were a number of cases that were thrown out, and that was due to, quote, uncertainty of the quality of the reported tornado start time and or the location. 
And um, that resulted in uh, 669 cases being examined. And of that, uh, it was about 27% of significant tornado cases were associated with a cell merger. So nearly one out of three times, roughly, uh, you could have that tornadic cell merger, but that still means almost two-thirds of the time you're not going to have the, the cell merger. So what might be uh, some of the reasons? Before we get into that, some of the storm classifications that uh, he and his team looked at would be discrete, cluster, broken line, and line. Discrete's pretty easy to understand. A cluster of storms is also easy to understand if you've lived in this area uh, long enough as well. Um, broken lines and lines are, are examined here as well. And the reason why I bring those up is because when you look at uh, the, this, this sample size, just over uh, 100 cases resulted in a tornadic merger within the discrete category. That's the far left. So. That's pretty easy to conceptualize that uh, of the ones that produce a tornadic merger, so your red boxes, most of those are going to be discrete cells. That kind of goes along with maybe towards that LaFontaine storm where it was nice out and open. It had a nice environment perhaps to work with. But then as you move to more of the, the noisier setups, the, the cells in clusters, the cell in the line, and then even the lines, um, you have a much uh, l lower sample of the tornadic mergers that are happening. But generally, overall, you have all kinds of uh, tornado reports, and only a small fraction of them are happening uh, be because of the, of the mergers that are going on. Now, I thought this graph uh, was just absolutely fascinating. What you're looking at here is the time of the merger relative to the tornado. So this is zero minutes, uh, so you kind of infer that the tornado was happening um, right at the center. So your merger is typically going to happen anywhere from 10 minutes to this zero to five minutes before that tornado happens. So if, as I understand, if, if your merger happens and then you get like 10 minutes beyond that, you could probably ease off of that storm a little bit. Once again, this is a small sample size, but it's something to, so, something to consider. So I looked at this for the Macy storm, and the merger was completed at about uh, 2342Z, and about nine minutes later, the tornado um, touched down. Though with that one, it is a little hard to tell if it was a true cell merger because there was just kind of that little little push of moisture, that little push of outflow. So can you call that a cell merger? So it may be a little tough to tell. Uh, but if it were a cell merger, maybe nine minutes would be what we're looking at for that one. For the roll tornado, it's also a messy setup because you had that huge outflow um, from, from the storms coming in from the southwest push out through there. But um, that one might be on the longer side of about 15 minutes. So you would be pushing yourself uh, more towards this side of the graph with the merger happening about 15 minutes before the tornado happening. Um, so with those two significant tornadoes that we had in our county morning area, that's how that research kind of shapes out with that. Now this paper was dense. Um, I had to read through it a couple times, so I'm going to do my do my best here to, to kind of digest it for you. And it goes into all kinds of uh, model numerical simulations that um, I will not be that I'm not interested in sharing with you in this kind of environment because uh, you all perhaps would glaze over and my <laughs> eyes would glaze over perhaps as well. But if you do want to read it, um, get your phones ready for the references and you can take a look at it. But um, anyway. Um, they're modeling a, a series of supercells, and what they're introducing are, are these boundary layer rolls. And the way they describe them is these counter-rotating horizontal vertices that are characterized by these alternating bands of updrafts and downdrafts. And you're able to get these from your thermal and dynamic instabilities. So if you're a student in the room, you might be able to kind of conceptualize a little, a little bit of this um, pretty well. Um, I, I like to kind of like to latch on the, the symbol updrafts and downdrafts, and then your thermal and dynamic instabilities. Is also, I understand, it's kind of a way to see how the supercell is going to be um, interacting with itself. And through their uh, modeling abilities, they're able to uh, initiate these both perpendicular and then parallel to a supercell that is moving to the right. So they did a variety of simulations, and in part when they were looking through these simulations, and, and this is where it becomes, I feel, most relevant to the, to the cases um, that I'm presenting, is, is considering the impacts of the anvil series 
that you get as these big storms come up. So your, so your anvil uh, hanging over the storms. And they, they had a, five total conclusions, and I'm going to share um, ju just a few of them. And the first conclusion I'm going to read directly is, uh, when boundary layer convection and cloud shading are included, the magnitude of the sin increases, where CAPE and LCL generally decrease in the proximity of these two conceptualize, right? If you have clouds, your instability, your cave is going to go down, and your sin is going to increase. Okay, so, so that, that's pretty straightforward. The other thing to consider, their, their uh, second conclusion reads, the low-level shear increases in proximity to the supercell thunderstorms, largely due to low-level inflow acceleration by the storm updraft. And the extent of that and its influence on storm relative helicity is going to depend on the base state of the hodograph shape. So there are instances where uh, your low-level shear is going to increase in the proximity of your supercells as well. And then their fifth and final conclusion that I'm going to share with you here is that uh, shallow cumulus clouds in the inflow region are suppressed near the storm, and they found that that's regardless of the anvil shading, and that's owing to a region of subsidence around the main updraft. So when I show you some satellite here, you might be able to see some examples of that where, where these shallow cumulus clouds um, are, are, are being suppressed near the storm. So, so those are kind of some of the key points that I wanted to, to pull from this paper and, and perhaps share with you all in the next slides some of the satellite information that we might be able to, to, to gather through there. So this is our mesosector analysis from 22Z to 01Z. And I want you to consider how the cloud cover from the nearby storms might be impacting the storm's environment. So the easy one that I like to think about is the interaction of the cape. Um, you can kind of think about maybe a little thermal gradient that might be going on. But then you can also take from the researchers maybe thinking about uh, some of the shear uh, elements that, that might be going on as well. Um, but you'll notice that the storms really do get going on what is the far eastern edge of the anvil cirrus um, early on in this loop. And you see all these little shallow cumulus trying to get itself going. And then with time, just all of a sudden, boom, now we have our nice line of storms. And that's about where I started our analysis on GR2. The other thing that I'd like to point out, and not only is that storm still churning really, really well in the southeast, but you can see in this loop here a little bit of the outflow from the storms that surged off to the north and east and perhaps resulted in that constructive interference with the storm that went on to produce the roll tornado. Now, perhaps I think where this anvil shading and its impacts becomes a little muddy is, you know, how do you explain it's 9, 10 o'clock at night, and we have all the tornadoes that happened in Wilmington's area. Um, and also at that point, you know, the anvil shading was just enormous, as you can see um, late, on, late on this satellite image here, now turning to infrared. Um, just a huge anvil shadow, but, you know, yet again, you're, you're, you're still churning out storms like crazy. And that's probably where, where your uh, warm front plays a role. But, um, you know, during the day, it is interesting to think about how that anvil shadow might play a role or how it may not play a role. Interference is complicated. <laughs> that, that's the main conclusion that I, that I gathered, gathered from doing this. Um, and, and looking through some of the research papers, it's, it's very challenging to pick out, you know, okay, this is resulting in that. Because when you think about this and that, then there's some other outside factor that you may not have considered and now you have to think about as well. But I, I, I think that I can safely say that the roll tornado was a result of constructive interference. Now, if I see that same setup again, outflow coming in from the south and uh, from the south and west, and I have a supercell tracking off to the east, is it going to result in another example of a roll tornado? I don't know. Um, sample size is, is very small. I do think that maybe constructive interference is possible in the null tornado example. So the ones where you know we had that nice that nice uh, couplet going on for so long, but then we didn't quite get a tornado out of it. So so that's something to perhaps consider. And then I, and then really overall, um, this this is true in a lot of cases. Beware of the frontal boundaries. Um, the, the frontal boundaries boundaries were likely the, the the main driver in this event. That that warm front that was snaked off uh, to to the east during this event. Um, that was likely the main uh, one of the main sustaining factors uh, during this event as opposed to the little constructive and destructive interference examples that might be going on. So I do have some time uh, to, to take your questions at this time. I thank you for your attention.
Any questions? Yep, up here. In the area of subsidence uh, near the main boundary updraft, do you, does that, in a very kind of, not even a sort of smaller scale way, cap the environment a little bit, <coughs> and perhaps you know, sort of suppressed until you get ex you know, explosive development? When either, when either something comes through you know, to break it, so for example, when you get your constructive interference and, and you get and you get an outflow boundary that comes in and maybe breaks that, does that actually occur? Do you think? That, that is totally plausible. So, so if I if I summarize this correctly, you know, thinking about a, a capped environment near a storm because of the subsidence, and then you have. In, in this example, perhaps that convective outflow acting as, as, as the mechanism to break the cap. I totally think that, that, that that's definitely plausible. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Yes? Yeah, the, in terms of the anvil shading, I can understand why if the, the, the anvil you know, reduce some of the sunlight reaching the ground, you get less cake, right? Because the, the temperature in the water level is going to be cooler. Why is the LCO lower? That is a piece that I would have to dig into my bag and find that section of the paper. Um, yeah, it, that, that, that's an interesting question. And, and really, I, I did almost oversimplify uh, portions of that paper. It, it's a long paper. There were, in fact, like six different simulations and scenarios with those boundaries and the anvil shadow. They went on to you know, change how the ice nuclei is shaped and how transparent it is and things like that. Um, so. We can we can sit down later and really dig into it. <laughs> I was just thinking, right? But if you lower the LCL, right, then you're probably going to get the level of free convection faster. But then that would give you more cake. So the, the Sure, sure, yeah, that, that's a fair point when you think about it in the, the Barter scan. And I think that, that kind of goes back to the conclusions of if you think you have A and B, well then did you think about C? And here we are thinking about C, how, how it might impact the other one. So it's, it's a very, <coughs> imagine that, a very dynamic system. Yeah. You would lower the LCL because you're cooling the environment, right? But I mean, but 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 to get to a but to get to a lower level of convection, then I mean, yeah, I agree with you. But you then have to have that lifting mechanism that actually forces you. You get the lower LCL and the lower K because of the shadowing, and if you don't get that interference, that that boundary, nothing happens. But if you get the boundary, then you have the LFC at a lower altitude, and then you go they on your way. Yeah. But cake though is potential energy, right? It's right. assuming that you have the lifting already. Right. So you lower the LCL, right? Because you're integrating from the level free convection to the equilibrium yeah. level. You're going to increase the cake just because you're integrating over a longer distance. Do I have time for any more questions? <laughs> Thanks for chiming in on that, both of you. Thanks. Anything else? Yes. Is there any kind of a layman's handbook for uh, sounding analysis? My default, uh, as far as uh, like uh, skew T interpretation. Yeah. The, the, um, the the Met Ed and Comet websites are phenomenal um, for that type of thing. Um, I know that they have a specific. Um, uh, kind of online training course. It's free. You just need an email, um, and and it can walk you through sounding analysis. Um, I know that I've taken that at least a couple of times. Um, it's always a, yeah, Met Ed M E T E D. Um, if you do a Google search for that, plug in your email. Um, there's a whole <coughs> bunch of courses that you can chime in on. I think we're going to wrap it up there so we can get our next presentation. Very good, cool. thanks. Okay.